Nicolas, the director of Nipin uh, Propel, uh, and uh, very happy to have you on board today. It's the second session of the Daily Talks, and these Daily Talks aim at really helping the ball rolling uh, in the real estate innovation field. We know that the situation is trickier than usually, so uh, everything that can uh, help people remain connected and uh, uh, still have opportunities to learn and to discuss what's going on is, is, is a very good thing uh, to do. Uh, today, uh, Taylor Westcott, general partner as, uh, at Concrete VC, uh, is we, with us and is going to talk about a very important topic for sure and a topical issue that is PropTech in the light of coronavirus. Um, most of, of you know probably Taylor uh, from a long time, but maybe some of you don't know him, so I'm sure he's he going to introduce himself at the beginning and let you know what we are facing currently uh, when it comes to uh, PropTech and COVID-19. Uh, we are sure that there are some good and maybe some bad perspectives. So let's take the time uh, to have uh, Taylor letting us know what's going on. Taylor, the, the, uh, the online stage is yours. Hi, thanks, Nicola. Um, I think I supposed to share my screen here. Um, let's see. So, hi everybody. Um, I hope you're all safe and your families are safe and you're um, improving yourselves considerably if you're uh, home without kids and you're um, surviving if you're home with kids. Um, I certainly know that we're finding it a struggle to manage three kids um, who are still on vacation, but even when they start online schooling, it's gonna be a challenge. Um, so uh, look, Concrete is a, um, it's an investment uh, and advisory group that we started about three years ago. We work with um, a bunch of large real estate partners like our group uh, for whom we also help them make investments. Um, and then a number of other real estate partners that we help just in an advisory capacity like Seagrow Industrial and Logistics and Hammerson Retail and uh, Nuveen Asset Management and um, Clifford Chance and Locked In Insurance and and um, and, and Vinci uh, Construction and and so they help us understand what the key challenges in real estate are and so so we um, we help look at the early stage and so that's what I'll talk to you about uh, um, I don't have a 25 year background in real estate but I do have a 25 year background in in early stage technology and so we'll talk to you about what our kind of bread and butter is is which is how early stage companies are um, are addressing what we're seeing here as they serve the real estate sector. Um, so this is, you know, amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone who has for a brief time left their self isolation has just been shocked at the kind of ghost town nature of whatever very busy places they used to traffic. Um, and, and so, and everyone's wondering what this means and how long it will last and how it will impact various aspects of the space. And I'll share with you some of the thoughts that we've had um, in discussion with our partners, as well as with our, within our portfolio and other startups that we've talked to. So, so a few things have really kind of exploded in this time. Apps is one. So um, I, don't know if, I don't know if people can raise their hand in this, but um, City Mapper. Uh, so for those of you who live in London or one of the other cities that City Mapper serves, you maybe use this to see when your tube is coming or how to get from point A to point B. They have some really interesting information. Um, for example, uh, here's a, one of their um, consumer mobility index or, or city mobility index slides. So on the left is London yesterday. So percent of the city moving versus five weeks ago. Um, and you can see five weeks ago, um, Italy was starting to significantly slow things down but but some of the other cities and if you have the app you can go and find this and scroll down some of the other cities were still quite active whereas today um, we see the numbers of course are down tremendously and, and apps um, are, are, are able to bring uh, a fascinating level of real real-time information um, into the decision making processes that real estate companies use and so I don't know that this screen itself would necessarily help drive real estate purchasing or, or investment or, or disposal decision, but the kind of information that provides these things um, 
I think will increasingly figure into, into how um, real estate companies do make decisions. So for example, companies that track the behavior of retail shoppers, um, and which is all down right now, but of course, um, it, you know, it, it varies over the course of the day in normal life. And, and sometimes you can tell if your shoppers like going to Costa Coffee or they like going to Starbucks or they like going to Waitrose or they like going to Tesco. And um, that can help you make uh, your investment decisions. Um, uh, so I'll just kind of walk through asset class by asset class and share with you what we're seeing and what we think is going to happen. Um, uh, in Resi and Office, probably the two uh, mainstays of the real estate world, you know, near term, tough. Uh, you know, we have um, we have a couple of portfolio companies that are in the residential sector. One helps you, one opportunity helps you buy them. Um, one Travtis helps you um, live in them and, and get them fixed if your flat has something broken or find a, a flat to live in. Um, and then one in the office sector, Hubble, who helps um, uh, help you find a flex space uh, or, or do something that's not like a major lease. Um, and, and so they, you know, they're all seeing demand go down a bit. Um, and it's anyone's guess as to when it will come back up. But what we hope is that um, in the long term, we'll see benefits coming up uh, for tech in these spaces. So for example, um, in the buying of residential, when um, people start buying again, or when the government lets them go and look at homes to buy, we think we'll see a jump in mortgages. We, th we think we'll see the banks try to get a bunch of new mortgages in. Um, we, think, we think the digital distribution of that capability um, will, will, will do well. So for example, tr Trussell or um, Hubby, to help find mortgages, we think they'll they'll do great coming out of this. We're we're optimistic that opportunity will as well. Um, we think once you live in a place, we think things like digital property management will do well because there's less of a requirement for face to face. Um, in, in the office sector, uh, we think there's going to be a lot of pain. We believe that companies will not only think much harder before they sign a long-term lease. We believe that they, the companies that are already in a long-term lease will need to do something about that because they've hopefully found that their employees are quite productive from home. Um, they may need to give them better internet connections, let's say, um, but employees, once they, I guess, have found a good rhythm and have, started to use Zoom more often, um, there, there'll be less desire for everyone to gather in one place all the time. Um, so uh, we think Flex will do well out of this, um, that people will look, companies, occupiers will look for shorter leases, maybe smaller spaces, um, maybe a different usage pattern. Um, if it's, let's say, everybody's in the office two days a week rather than five days a week um, will change the, the nature of the lease that an occupier might want to take. Um, or if they want to be in five different offices, uh, smaller offices, more spread around to where people live rather than one central office in let's say Canary Wharf. Um, we're, we're optimistic that uh, Flex will move faster than previously expected. Um, we think uh, virtual viewings will do really well. So our, um, a company in our portfolio, Matterport, has the Financial Times just published an article that Matterport demand has increased 6x in the last month. Uh, and that, that's uh, taking 3D models and it's easier for you to go and see a space without having to physically travel to the location and coordinate access and things like that. Um, so we think that stuff will do well. We think virtual everything will do well. We, we think. Um, we've, we saw today an announcement that Confido, which does um, identity verification for um, all kinds of different stuff, like say opening bank accounts or what have you, anyone who's opened a um, Revolut bank account or um, a Monzo bank account will have gone through a virtual um, identity 
check process and that it could have been provided by Onfido or someone like that. So TPG just gave them a hundred million. Um, so that stuff's pretty exciting. And we, we may see things like an increased focus on um, IoT as it relates to air quality. So I have recently been approached by several startups that are that have air purifiers that they think they can get to a level where it should kill, you know, coronavirus in the air. Um, it, I think everyone acknowledges we know very little about that, but you could imagine there would be a certain level of demand for anything that helps people feel more safe. Um, so that's office and residential. Uh, hospitality, this is a tough one. Um, you, you know, our, our partner Starwood is deep in this space. Um, They've also been in this game for a long, long time, and they've been through, um, uh, you know, 2001 and 2006 and seven, and so they're they, um, you know, they're, they're careful about the way they they manage um, uh, their funds. Um, so they'll be fine, no doubt. Uh, but hotels are are going to have a hard time. So people that are going to struggle uh, with things like this will be in the startup world at least, uh, besides hotels. Um, the short-term let world where we've seen Airbnb just absolutely bottom out. Um, so all the companies that kind of hang off the back of that Airbnb ecosystem, I think we saw not too long ago, Hostmaker filed for administration, um, which is a, you know, they would take a lease from you or have a management contract from you and, and, um, and they would uh, then, do a short-term let for your flat. Um, there are others in that space like Kestredi and Air Sorted, and I, I don't know how they're doing, but um, but that stuff uh, I think will be will be pretty interesting. Um, uh, we think maybe opportunities in hospitality will come in the form of price harbor. So where race to the bottom is, is certainly a common technique in, in any any market opportunity. Um, I think maybe people will start paying a premium for flexibility in their um, contract. Or, you know, tr tr travel insurance is, is a good um, uh, version of that. So we could see maybe that taking off a bit. Um, we think there will be, and then also where cleaning was previously simply a table stakes. Um, we wonder if there might be a part um, a, a part of the market that looks for a premium cleaning services that uses that as a, as a branding technique to try and drive people back into um, the hospitality space. So you'd imagine if you were tentatively thinking about your family going on a vacation and you were looking at, I don't know, uh, three different uh, hotels or villas or whatever, the the one that heavily promoted their proactive policy that made sure all their staff were tested on a regular basis for fevers or whatever and that they you know came in and cleaned the place like twice a day and um you know did a deep clean between every guest you can imagine people being a little bit more inclined to give their money to that um provider that host um so that's uh hospitality um next one is another tough one retail so um, you know we 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 have a partner uh, Hammerson who um, is one of the premier retail operators in in the UK and and um, and they also have a lot of spaces in Europe. Um, there's no secret, and it, it's been public uh, sort of newspaper articles about the retail sector in general collecting. Um, you know, so, so somewhere near 50% of the rent that they um, would normally collect. Um, so that's pretty painful. Retail was already already in a tough spot because of the in increase of e-commerce. Um, so traditional retailers are going to take a lot of pain from this, um, you know, where there was simply a lot of a wave of company voluntary arrangements um, happening. We now think that, um, that there will be even more, right? Because if you can't trade, if you're operating on a, I don't know, um, single digit margin and you, you just require high volume in order to, to use, um, to, 
to cover your kind of fixed expenses, um, you're in a pretty tough spot if, if you can't fulfill that. The ones that have um, earlier experimented with omnichannel, the ones that have um, built up their e-commerce capability, they're probably doing better here because they can continue their online um, their online sort of distribution of their goods. Uh, so those companies will be in better shape. We think when retail comes back, so how will you get people back into the shops? I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head. Um, but we do think, again, like Office, where um, occupiers are thinking about should I take out a five-year lease on that space? You know, will 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 the government simply lift the isolation um, mandate, or will they lift it and then put it back, and then lift it and put it back, and lift it and put it back? No one knows. Um, so maybe I should be a little bit more tentative about my physical presence, and 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 that's flex retail. So we're confident that someone like um, uh, appear here for is one of one of the um, probably main flex retail providers um, in this space will probably do, do very well out of this. So much like office, um, being able to find a flexible space for your retail or otherwise kind of physical presence, presence marketing your goods um, will, uh, will, will kind of benefit from this and just accelerate its trend overall. Let's see, uh, industrial and logistics, they're killing it. Um, they were already doing great with the rise of e-commerce. Um, we've seen that, um, I don't know where to put this window. Um, we've seen that uh, Amazon is just exploding. I'm sure all of you from home have increased your e-commerce consumption. I know um, it's, it's uh, I I've certainly seen my delivery times go up. Um, it, there's it's been hilarious trying to get your online shopping, uh, grocery shopping even delivered. Um, if you could even find your way through the queue um, but uh, it's happening with all of e-commerce. And so what, we'll, what I think see here is where um, urban logistics was a, you know, maybe this will become big. So I'm thinking about uh, the Telereal Trillium acquisition uh, and, and Blackstone acquisition of all the, of the, of the rail arches. Um, that will probably explode in terms of uh, value because we'll probably find large retail operators looking to repurpose some of their um, spaces for logistics um, use. Let's say their shops want to use their um, their formerly walk-in shops to um, to now start supporting e-commerce operations. So there will be gr greater need for logistics-based functions, um, and and I think there's. There's a there's a huge demand. Uh, I think Savills published something that um, demand for industrial space was up 50 57 percent last month, something like that. I may have the number wrong, but um, but some pretty good numbers coming out of industrial. You know, data centers are part of that. Um, that's all going to explode. I'm sure Zoom has needed to pick up a few servers themselves. Um, we have seen that um, businesses that go after kind of non-automated um, uh, capacity increases. So where Ocado struggled to increase capacity because it's, it's all robots. So they have a, a limited, they have a kind of a cap on the amount of customers they can serve with their robotic picking mechanism. Um, we, Tesco and people that use um, people pickers that walk through the shops and, and throw stuff into your bags for you. Um, those people are able to, it, it's more expensive on, on, on a marginal basis, but they're able to increase capacity more easily than Okada needing to build an entirely new warehouse to serve one more customer. Um, uh, energy production. So we think as we see a rise in um, demand for industrial and logistics, anyone serving the space that helps those buildings supply their own, generate and supply the energy demand to their customer bases, we think will do well. Um, we think supply chain resilience will um, rise on the government agenda. So I think everyone's probably read articles about, I don't know, couldn't get enough hospital gowns for the NHS or maybe got a box of masks instead from China and, and, and um, maybe food production is uh, struggling and who knows how that will play out in the coming 
uh, months and, and, and quarters when this virus takes hold in traditional um, food producing nations that get um, that import into the UK, we think things like vertical farming might take off um, because supply during resilience will rise in, um, from an agenda priority standpoint at a, at a nationwide scale. Um, and then I guess to, to, to an extent, um, it, it may be that manufacturing uh, again becomes a little bit more of a priority on a on a national scale for every country. They don't want to get stuck with Donald Trump telling 3M not to deliver any N95 masks, breathing masks, to anyone outside the country. Um, no, no country wants to be in the situation where they're they they realize they can't keep their people safe if 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 some other country decides they need the entire output of a particular um, critical uh, safety good. So that's industrial. Um, generally, uh, we're excited about um, on demand. Uh, we're excited about um, virtual, right? So virtual via video, via um, 3D models, you know, AR instead of VR, I'm not so sure um, how much that will take off. I don't know. I think maybe AR uh, cl clothing, trying on clothing, uh, though that's not prop tech. Um, I'm having the time I spent at eBay and, and in other businesses where we interacted with fashion, that that this could be what's necessary to, to get that to take off. Um, uh, and then flex. We think flex generally where um, supply explodes, prices fall, um, demand is um, unreliable or bursty, you need solutions that give you uh, the ability, well, you want to see a lot of choice, of course, um, but you want the ability to kind of pick through and say, well, I want it to be dog friendly and I want to make sure there's a roof terrace, which sounds silly to say in this context, but it is summer um, or it's summer's coming. Um, the ability to down your options before you get up from your desk and then go out and physically visit these locations. And so um, it, we, we think um, digital discovery will, will explode for both um, retail and office. So we're, we're in the middle of um, raising a, a, a fund, uh, which is uh, not, not, not ideal situation. I'm just very excited that a new managing partner has just joined our, our group. Um, and so uh, we think we're, there are great companies um, that are created in the downturn. And here's a few examples um, from, the, from the last downturns. Um, we think the opportunity will come in, in tech generally. We think the opportunity will come in certain areas of prop tech specifically. Um, and we're, we're, we're finding that um, once the people that we go out and talk to have found their um, kind of baseline, their um, needs for keeping their team safe and, 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 and making them productive working from home, they will start turning their eyes to, okay, how can we take advantage of this opportunity? Um, and and we're, we believe uh, there will be a bunch of dry powder for the right companies. Um, don't know if I have more here. No, that's it. Um, so hopefully that was about 20 minutes and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, indeed, we have uh, a bit less than five minutes for some Q&A. Uh, I have answers to, to some very practical ones uh, during your, your speech. Uh, I've got one question. How well do you expect PropTech startups to weather this global shutdown? If particular sectors struggle, do you think that investment in those startups might swing more towards corporate or strategic VC as opposed to traditional VC? So yeah, good question, uh, Reed. Um, so a few of them in there. So how well do I expect prop tech startups to weather this global shutdown? Um, the, the, the easy answer is um, cash is king. If you have cash, you're in much better shape than a business that is slightly better than you that um, is just starting to raise capital. So cash is king in that situation. Um, it, I, I, I think that's prob that's the case with any tech sector, um, you know, leaving aside the ones that are that are doing exceptionally well. So that's that's the best answer I have uh, in a broad sense. 
Now, um, in terms of where will the investment come? So I, I think um, uh, startups will not swing more towards corporate and strategic VCs because I think it's in these environments where corporate and strategic VCs, and I really, I think they're one, you're talking about corporate venture capital um, that has a you know, strategic value to, to the startup. They tend to significantly retract investment in periods like this, whereas venture capital funds, private equity funds, um, while, while they are, um, you know, more tentative generally uh, and, and a little bit more targeted, they have their dry powder and these are where the opportunities come. So they will invest harder and heavier in a smaller number of companies, right? So, you know, you, as I pointed out, TPG's investment in, um, in on Fido, that's a big round because they think Ofido is going to explode, right? So I, I would imagine um, the next time Matterport raises money, I have a feeling, I think they raised something like 45, 48 million um, last time, but the next time they raise, you know, if they can show that their demand for cameras increased 6x in a month, like that's a pretty exciting deal to get into. Um, and I would imagine traditional VCs or traditional not just VCs, but you know, private equity companies and so forth will be um, will be excited to double down on those. Um, you know, where there's a strategic benefit to them, great. But um, I think VC, excuse me, VC generally will do very well um, in this space. Okay, thank you. I, I guess for the moment there's no additional question. Maybe I will uh, I, I will take the time to ask you maybe one last. To, uh, in, in these two last minutes. Do, do, do you feel like there's some change in regulations, in existing regulation that would be necessary or that would drive some new opportunities um, in the existing markets? There are some things we can do, some things we cannot do. Do you see some fields where regulation could help accelerating some of the trends you, you, you mentioned? Yes, pretty broad question. So you and I were talking about what you thought might happen in France, right? And so let's say yeah. you start opening offices again, but there are regulations about um, what kind of safety provision you need to make for your employees uh, if, if you're bringing people back into an office environment. I think that's entirely possible um, in terms of regulations. So, you know, generally loosening regulations in order to kickstart um, economy stuff could be could be helpful. I, I don't, um, I may have to punt on this one. I don't have anything specific in mind in that regard. I think, um, uh, you know, demand has to come back in a, in a meaningful way before the government will, certainly any well-advised government um, would take action from a regulatory standpoint, other than loosening things up and, and um, reducing pain. Um, uh, I've got one question coming from the Nordics. Uh, who are better placed, US or European based protect companies? Who are better placed? Um, that's a, again pretty broad. Uh, I don't, so other than answering it independent of coronavirus, right? So there's, there's probably an answer, corona. Um, uh, separately, um, you know, I think Magnus making trouble with me here. Um, so uh, I think, um, you know, U.S. companies, just a bigger market, more more competitive venture capital um, trying to get into startups. So, so I think U.S. companies find it generally easier to raise money and raise bigger rounds and, and grow more quickly. I think that's just that's just the reality of the, the different um, ecosystems we face. Um, do I think there's anything specific uh, with regard to um, PropTech relative to coronavirus? Um, I think the U.S. healthcare system is a disaster. I think we're only beginning to see the pain that the U.S. will go through as a result of that, my political opinions aside. Um, and where I think the, the European healthcare systems are, you know, I don't know, three, four, five, six of the best in the world. Um, and, and so the, it might be that um, their ability to recover from, um, they also don't have governors standing between 
you know, the one policy setter and 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 the populace. Um, and so you might find the smaller um, com countries with the with the better healthcare systems are, are able to rebound better um, than than a large one with a weak healthcare system. Um, so there's a bunch more questions have popped up. Um, uh, yeah. Can I take Helen's question here? Yeah, and, um, and I will. Uh, I will have one last uh, from the the private window, and and then. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so to Helen's question, um, uh, Flex Office. Do you think operators who own their own buildings will, rather than, lease them, will fare better? Yeah, I would have said that six months ago. Um, I think they will. Um, I think. I think if. I think lease arbitration as as a um, a channel for flex, um, you know, when we were kind of started to head down, um, I think everyone began to question that. So I think they'll struggle to raise capital. I think they will struggle to make end, ends meet. I think they will struggle to differentiate. Um, and if you can't do any of that, then it's harder to charge a, a brand premium for what you're offering. And if it's not that hard to simply offer flexible terms and um, you know more front of house and back of house pricing rolled in, so for example, um, if I can, um, I could lease you an office and you know lease you a space and just take that money, but if I leased you the space and charge you for the front desk and charge you for the maintenance and charge you for um, the coffee and charge you for the you know, the insurance on the deposit and charge you for the copiers and the printers and the, um, you know, the biscuits, M my ability to capitalize that much larger amount of money with my superior ability to raise uh, debt at a low cost of capital, it's going to be hard for someone um, to be, uh, um, to compete with that, right? Um, so I'm a big, I don't know, I'm, um, Nuveen or or um, Blackstone or somebody like that. Um, I can raise money cheaper than you can if you're WeWork or if you're. Um... Um, do you have some time left, Taylor? Yeah, 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 sure. So end of hot desking. Um, no, I don't think so. You know, hot desking is like a single digit percentage of the world of flex. So I, I don't think it's that significant. Uh, I also don't. I, I'm. I can't get my head around. Um, how densification will really take a hit because if I'm, I don't know that I feel more comfortable sitting two meters away from someone coughing than I do sitting one meter away from someone coughing. Um, I think I'll stop, probably still not want to be sitting next to that person. So I, I, I'm, I, I do hear um, smarter people than me saying densification is going to take a beating. I, I, um, so it, it's probably true. I just don't see it yet. Okay. Uh, may, maybe one or two questions left. What about yeah, yeah, the healthcare sector? Do you think there will be a social shift and there will be higher demand for residential services and supports? I gotta say, I don't, um, I don't have any expertise in that space. Um, you know, sadly, I think pension providers may be one of the sectors that does well out of this. Um, uh, higher demand for residential services and support, like, I, I could, I could see it, um, but I don't have a deep understanding of that space, so I, I don't think you should believe anything I say about that space. Um, sorry. Okay, so one last question: What do you think? Offices should absolutely put in place to welcome back their employees once the lockdown is lifted to make employees feel safer and more comfortable. Yeah, so screening, certainly. Um, I think much like, you know, going through an airport into a new country, people demonstrating that they're um, well uh, before coming in and, and being around others um, would be one. Um, do I think, uh, I think there's gonna be a shift towards allowing people to work from home more often. So I think um, all the corporates should, um, you know, sublease out, sublease out some of the unneeded space that they have. 
um, and and lease out small spaces in um, in in other uh, geographic areas so the person doesn't have to commute two hours to come into work, right? Um, small spaces that people can kind of rotate in and out. Um, I think that I think that would be um, that'd be good. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. It's the end of this session. You can uh, go back on the seaside that's behind you. Yeah, well, I'm going to get my surfboard. <laughs> Just for everyone, so tomorrow the, the topic will be the crisis impact on the flexible office market and co-working operators in Europe. So we will go into detail uh, on that topic with Dirk, Dirk Pelling, the founder and CEO of Work Europe and Inter Offices. Uh, so uh, 4 p.m. tomorrow, like every day, do not hesitate to connect and thanks a lot for your participation today. Thanks, Taylor. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Be safe.